before we begin, let's start with a word of prayer. Father, we give you thanks and praise for this new day. Father, thank you for your mercies that are new to us each and every day. As we gather in this place, that we ask that your truth might guide us. We ask that by your spirit, you might guide us not only to understand history, but also to understand our own direction. Even as we endeavor to walk in those good works which have been prepared for us by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and in whose name we pray. Amen. So, um, we are on week two, week two of our study of church history, church history that runs from the beginning of the Crusades through the Reformation. Uh, we have the notes, these notes, you, you, you better have them, they were laboriously prepared. It's possible I may be looking at a typing test or something in the future, that's why I do this, I'm not sure. Um, but, um, so what you see on the top of the page is Crusades to the Reformation. This is week two, or part two, of the Crusades segment. Hopefully, if I don't dally too long on any one topic, we'll actually finish up the Crusades this week and move on from there for the uh, remaining weeks of the course. Um, just a couple of disclaimers. A couple of disclaimers. The first one is a theological disclaimer. This is a uh, this is an history course, and it's my attempt to present to you the best of modern scholarship on, on these topics. Um, like everyone else, I have a theological opinion, which may be different from yours. Um, for the most part, I'm trying to keep the theological opinion out of it. But if you ask me a question, especially if you ask me what I think, I'll probably tell you. The, the, other, the other part of that, I'm sure I say this every time I do a course like this, is when I was, uh, when I was a kid, my mom always told me, in polite company, you never talk about what? <laughs> Religion and politics. Well, well, I probably learned some of my mom's other lessons pretty well, but that one I didn't get, because probably from that day I haven't stopped talking about religion and politics. <laughs> so yeah, ask me, I want to tell you what I think. Um, the other disclaimer is an academic disclaimer. I mentioned last week that scholarship is always in flux. At least good scholarship is always in flux. The moment you think you have all the answers as a scholar, it is time to retire. Uh, so, so sometimes I'll talk about dates. If I remember to, I will say is Kierke that day or is approximately that day. Because what we're discovering is that, well, there's an old expression: history is written by the whom? Winners. Thank you. By the victors. Yes, history is written by the victors, and, and, and they sometimes have a way of changing things around just a little bit to make the dates line up in a favorable fashion. Initially speaking, that's all we have to go on, but eventually, eventually the truth will out. So, um, having, said, having said that, I'd like to begin with a little bit of a review. I know I unloaded just tons, maybe literally tons of information on you last week, but I don't expect you to remember it, at least not when we get the final exam. <laughs> Thank you, I'm glad you left. Um, so, a little bit of a review, kind of a synopsis. Uh, it, it would be good if you remember these things, possibly because it'll make you look very smart and popular. Uh, but also, these might actually be useful as you think about your own walk of faith. The, the time period we're discussing, we talk about the Crusades. I mark this 1054, even though the Crusades obviously don't start until almost a half century later. But it marks this 1054 because so much of our precursors to the Crusades begin, they're specifically dealing with what? Specifically dealing with the schism between the East and the West. Um, and continue on, well, to about 1291, 
Although there is some who would say, and I'll mention this later on, that in fact they don't really end until about 1302, 1303 or thereabouts. So leading up to the first, leading up to the first crusade, um, Europe is beginning to emerge, and we sometimes refer to as the, the Dark Ages. Why are the Dark Ages called the Dark Ages? All information was suppressed? Well, probably not all, but there wasn't a lot of education. So people's minds were dark. Mm -hmm. like, well, yeah, knowledge was uh, not, not, not only was it absent, it was in fact in some ways forcibly suppressed. Um, you know, if, you, if you've been talking about the Crusades suppressing, what can we do a study on uh, so called dark ages? So Europe is beginning. Just yes, sir. My uh, very faithful colleague, a Catholic, insisted on referring to it as the Age of Faith, not the Dark Ages. Well, okay. <laughs> All right, I can, go, I can go there. No problem. It is, it is the Age of Faith in a number of different ways. One is that the church held enormous sweat. The church, government, Government, the church. Oh, sure, there were secular authorities, there were kings, there were petty princes, there were dukes and earls, all kinds of secular rulers. There was even some attempt at democracy in the places of sorts. But the church in, in the West, when I say the West, I mean Europe, essentially, uh, particularly in Northern Europe, Western Europe, the church called sweat. People's lives were very much governed by the edicts of the church. And, and that was it. Yeah. That was it. Were the achievements of the Greeks and the Romans, all the technology lost? The they, weren't, they, weren't, they weren't lost entirely. But they did a really nice job of hiding. Yeah. Um, now, age of faith is, is, is a positive thing, right? I mean, it sounds good. And, and dark ages is a pejorative sounding thing. And by the way, the suppression of knowledge, a couple of you brought up, is a pretty pejorative thing. And I suppose it depends on one's perspective. Because you see, if we talk about the Middle Ages, or the early Middle Ages, the age of faith, the indication, the intimation, is that at some point, we ran into an age of less faith. Right? If we have an age of faith, then we must have had an age of no faith, or age of declining faith. And that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting thing. For a lot of folks, faith and knowledge, faith and learning are mortal enemies. Right? right? Yes, sir. What are the chronological numbers of the years? When we say dark ages is from when to when, middle ages is from when to when. Let's see. Um, all numbers are approximate. Okay. okay. Uh, dark ages, we're talking about 7800, 7800 to about 1000. Middle ages following. Um, Renaissance, we get into uh, the beginning of the 16th century and maybe the 15th century, if you were in certain areas. In some of the more advanced others. So right now we're talking about the Dark Ages. They are about 800. Some would say earlier. Again, all this are approximate. To about 1,000, maybe 1,100. Um, so faith, knowledge, some would see as 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 more enemies. Um, and here I go again. I would tend to disagree, by the way. I, I would suggest that true faith, faith that is granted by the Spirit, actually cannot be disturbed by knowledge at all. Even if for a period of time that knowledge seems to contradict the faith. Now, um, I, I, I did a little lecture on this, just that, and boy, all the tears on it, but. but um, I'm probably going to refer to that period just for convention's sake, by the way, as Dark Ages, just because that's what's in my notes. But uh, age, age faith, in some ways, it was. 
And although here I go again, being opinionated, I, I would question whether that faith was placed in the Christ who people profess to follow, or in fact placed in a church which seemed extremely, extremely powerful, although at the time, certainly the powers that be would have suggested that what the church said is what Christ wanted. Um, okay, so you're coming out of the dark ages. Uh, 1095. The Emperor of Constantinople, that's Emperor Alexius II, uh, says, hey, we need some help. The, 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 the Turks are beginning to push at our borders. So even though, back in 1054, back in 1054, east went one way, west went the other way, politically and in some ways theologically, nonetheless, the Emperor of Constantinople is appealing to those he still considers to be his brother Christian, saying, Hey, we've got this scourge pushing from the outside. And, and, and sure enough, Pope Urban II in Rome calls Christians together for a crusade. He begins to preach this. He begins to preach this. He begins to instruct the bishops to preach this. We need to take up arms. Well, interestingly enough, as they said, take up the cross. Taking up the cross was a common expression in those days for going on what we say is taking up the cross. Part of it had to do with the cross they wore, sun under clothing. Um, if you want to get really picturesque, want to get really picturesque, this is probably true. Some of the holiday is probably true. When someone became a knight, how was how this done? What, what did you do? They knelt before the king. They knelt before the king, and the king was holding what? Sword. 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 Right, a sword. A sword, at least the kind of swords that Europeans use, was a straight piece of metal, typically sharpened on both, sharpened on both ends, and it had something over here, like this. What does that do? Keeps you from cutting your hand off on the sword. But if you hold the point down, it looks kind of like a stylized cross. And, 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 and here I go again, the opinion it seems like one weapon and that ought to be looking a lot like another. Because let's be honest that a cross is a method of execution. Um, so, Paul Burton II calls Christians to be to take up the cross, he says, against the Muslims. 1096, Crusaders march with several armies with the Holy Land. In the process, by the way, they uh, kind of wreak havoc with everything in their path. Particularly, particularly those from the, sorry, German Paul, the cunning branch of the Crusades. The, the, the German Crusaders were particularly known for um, wiping everything they didn't like out. And mostly it turns out they didn't like were the Jews. Okay, so I want you to imagine this mass march of tens of thousands of people across the European countryside. They didn't have tanks, they didn't have personnel carriers, they certainly had airplanes. Mostly they walked. Tramping across the countryside, encountering a synagogue. Well, that's not Christian, let's burn that. Encountering a ghetto. By the way, a ghetto is an old term for where Jews were told they had to live in otherwise Christian lands. We don't lie back. They're not Christian. Not only they were thinking, well, they're practicing for the Muslims, or they just figured, well, let's just take care of everybody. What's the old expression? Kill them all, let God sort them out. Um, so that's, that was the first crusade. First armies arrived in Constantinople, crossed the Bosphorus to attack the Turks. One of those armies, led by Peter the Hermit, I suppose you've got a guy named Peter the Hermit, he's going to lead an army, mostly a common folk, he's going to lead an army of folks who are not prepared as soldiers. Further they got, 
Armor labels, you don't have. Brute force, they may have swords, knives, crossbows. They don't have. It's not very bad. Sir? So, where were the Peter the Hermit and his crew from? It sounded like it was like they were barbarians. <sighs> barbarians, um, you know, you know it's, 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 it's interesting. By the time we get to the 10th, 11th century, barbarian went from being a term of people who actually lived outside a certain region to a, a, a pejorative kind of, as in you barbarian. Um, so, so they're from, you know, they're they're from they're from they're from Europe. They're from they're from they're from Europe. Somewhere between somewhere between what we would think of today is Germany, France. That's where Screw was from. They were they were the poor people basically. They were the average people. Remember, I mentioned that when this crusade was preached, folks had a chance to give up the land. They had a chance to leave their, their servitude. And we'll see that theme uh, uh, reappears a number of times. Um, so, so the folks were very anxious to do this, all were very enthusiastic about it. And by the way, age of faith. Age of faith. You see, one of the things about the common folk, I guess you have credit. Is they honestly believe that God was on their side. See, they, they bought when the Pope tells the bishops and bishops of the congregation, God needs to do this. They believe it. So they believe that God would grant them victory. They believe they were doing a good thing. Never mind the fact they're not soldiers. Never mind the fact they're not all parents. Well, what happened, probably much to a surprise, is that Peter the Hermit's army was massacred. It was destroyed by the Turks. Because, you know, you imagine, you imagine amateurs going up against a professional army that outnumbers them and outguns them. And that sometimes that works. The American Revolution, for example. Although the Roman doesn't work first. This particular case did not work. Um, the other results of the First Crusade, again, ill prepared, ill provisioned. But many, many people thought it took two years to make this journey. Two years to make this journey. Probably because it's a long way by foot, but also probably because they kept stopping to fight battles and do things. And eventually they get past the place where they can fish anything. They get past the place where they can buy or steal or pillage. They're just a wilderness. Kind of salvation. Um, 1099, despite these hardships, the Crusaders from Europe did indeed conquer Jerusalem. And in the process, Managed to kill a significant portion of everyone living there. Who's living in Jerusalem right now? Well, not half the dead. Muslims, obviously, that was the problem. But also Jews and Orthodox Christians. By the way, kind of like today. Kind of like today. But the Crusaders said, well, we're going to get rid of the Muslims. We don't like the Jews, and by the way, the Orthodox Christians. Look, all the law like Jews, so. Sir, were there any interference done before that time by the Muslims to the Christian pilgrims? Was it an open city for pilgrims? Were there a pretext in that way to justify this action? The, the, largest, the largest pretext actually comes from the Turks, who are Muslims, attacking, attacking the Eastern Empire, attacking the Italian. That's the largest pretext. And it kind of becomes guilt by association. Well, if those Muslims, if those Muslims are attacking Constantinople, boy, it's not going to be long before we won't be able to make many pilgrimages there. There are always skirmishes. There have always been highwaymen in that area. There have always been piracy. And some of the pirates were Muslim. But for the most part, for the most part, there wasn't a huge armed force to say, no, you cannot come here to the um, that's not to say it never happened, by the way. It happened sometimes. 
but not necessarily as a concerted effort. So we might have been using modern terminology to describe the first crusade, at least when they finally got to this as a preemptive effort. The idea was this could happen. These people are violent, they're gaining the strength. And, and by the way, we want that holy city for ourselves. The problem is that Jerusalem, the holy city, for three different religions, still is, by the way. Holy city for Islam, obviously a holy city for, for, for Jews, and it's a holy city for Christians. So, it's hard to share. Um, continuing our review. So, between 1101 and 1144, after they, after they succeed, which would say is a success, what do they do? They come in, they occupy. They come in and they occupy, and they set up four crusader states. Um, this may have been a strategic error because it was difficult to make. The it wasn't particularly sustainable. And part of that has to do with the human nature. You get comfortable, you let your guard down. And that, by the way, is what led to the second to say. Um, let me just point out here uh, it, 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 it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to note, um, uh, kind of interesting to note that uh, it's, it's, it's right about this time. Uh, in the 11th and 12th century, Asia Faith. Big, big building plans. The beginnings of the great cathedrals in Europe. Come at the same time. Um, a lot of the European cathedrals you see now uh, are, are built at this period, although there are quite a few that, at least foundationally, date back to this period. Um, this is, by the way, in Milan. Um, the um, success tends to be against success. Right? Something goes well, you think, wow, we did that. What else can we do? Okay, continue to review. 1146, 1148, second crusade. And it's essentially a failure. Why is there a second crusade? There's a second crusade because those crusader states were not sustainable. They lost them. They were attacked from without, possibly even from within. So the second crusade, take it back. Um, 1187. 1187. Muslims led by a guy named Saladin. Later it comes the salt of Egypt. By the way, original line was well uh, Took back Jerusalem. And, and that brings us to the third crusade, the part that I, that I left out. And I left it out because it's so involved. And I guess any of the later crusades were politically involved. But I wanted to use a third crusade as an example. So, so here we go. Um, so, solid, by the way. Um, the Third Crusade, Third Crusade is also called the King's Crusade. It was an attempt by European leaders to once again reconquer the Holy Land from Saladin, the Sultan of Egypt. From a military perspective, we might actually describe this uh, campaign as being successful. It turns out the European Forces captured a number of important cities, uh, most notably uh, Acre and Jaffa. They also reversed uh, uh, many of Solomon's other conquests. The only thing is the Third Crusade once again failed to take back Jerusalem. Now it becomes interesting. I wrote there the notes of the plot thickens. I still want to come to make light of something very serious. Um, so, after the failure of the second crusade, the king, uh, Sharif really, uh, 
control of Damascus and unified Syria. The enormous power block. Some of this may sound familiar to you. How do you feel, the military here, or anybody else who can follow these things, how, how do you feel with the United Middle East, the United Islamic Middle East, as opposed to a chaotic Middle East? How, how does that feel if all of a sudden those various Arab nations, if the Muslim states stop fighting with each other, and became a power? Right. Same thing happens here. Okay? The kings are feeling threatened. Now, what's interesting is that then and now, Muslims, not like Christians, not particularly they love each other. They're going to do a whole thing on this inside the Nazi, and of course, all together. But different branches of Islam will fight them bitterly. Now, see if you can follow the logic of this, because I'm not sure I can, but here it is. Okay? So, if you've got a general, and he's got his young nephew, the Saladin. The, they're now warring, trying to take over Egypt. So Egypt's sultan then, Shawar, calls on King Amalek. Who's he? He's the king of Jerusalem, placed, in, placed by the Europeans after the last crusade. So here's a Muslim saying to the king of Jerusalem, hey, we need your help against these other Muslims. Yes, sir. Could it help to think of this as a secular power struggle? Based on this is very much a secular power struggle. Yeah. No doubt about it. This is a secular power struggle, even though it's couched in religious terms. And, and history will tell us that a lot of holy wars have in their heart a struggle for power, a struggle for land, a struggle for resources. And we tend to cover that up with God or the gods on our side. Now, that's uh, Omrik, by the way, in Jerusalem, he's a stylized uh, mosaic. No, sorry, fresco. Um, so, you know, it's all, it's all there for you. It's sitting there at 3 a.m. going through all this stuff. But, what I want to suggest, the most important part of this, to just go on the next page, is that Amalek does mean align himself with Sharar, and now you have a combined Muslim Christian army, fancy that, fighting on the same side. They turn their forces on Egypt, um, but it doesn't take Amalek long to betray his ally. Betrays his ally, and now Shar is just trying to his former enemy. Well, Shar is executed. He's executed because his Muslim colleagues are not be thrilled to align himself with Christians, and the Christians show their true color, at least from their perspective, by turning against him. Well, we go on. Shar is executed. Um, the kid, Saladin, is, 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 is his date successor. Um, Nur al-Din dies, leaving a new empire to an 11 year old son, who does not live very long. Amrik dies in 1174, leaving Jerusalem to his 13 year old son, Baldwin IV. Baldwin actually turned out to be, uh, among other things, by the way, he was a leper. He was a leper. But he's also, for a 13 year old kid, I mean, anybody a fairly adept military commander. And uh, managed to defeat Solomon. 
Uh, imagine that, a 13-year-old kid manages to defeat the greatest general of the Islamic world. Um, well, success once again does funny things. There's a character by the name of Renald. Renald is, um, well, I, I, I call him a pirate, and I have to apologize to pirates everywhere. <laughs> he, was a, he was a bad guy. He was also a, a noble. But he played very cool. He liked to steal a little stuff. He, he organized uh, pirates on the high seas. He organized high robbers. Um, eventually, he's in prison, and eventually, he's not executed. It was hard to execute all of them. He's let out of prison. And the young king aligns himself with his fellow, Renald. He's a bigger well, he's got a lot of followers, he knows his business, and maybe he's learned his lesson. Well, after Baldwin dies, Renald starts playing both sides, both sides of the uh, defense. He makes allies with some of the Muslims. And then turns against them while also turning against his own people. The upshot of that, I will live by the sword, die by the sword, and all his treachery, he saw the opportunity he needed to take effects against the kingdom. And in 1187, they see the city of Tiberius, and the Frankish army is completely destroyed. Now, Solomon apparently was not without honor. Frankish army was destroyed, and the Mole, Renal, and the king, and the king died. That was the name like that. Your Majesty, the king died. I don't know if you had anything, you know, you didn't have a really cool name like innocent. <laughs> or urban. That's not a guy. Hey, guy. Well, Guy and Renal are captured. And, and they're brought to the Solomon's tent. And it seems that Solomon has some respect for King God. He, he, um, he does something very interesting. They bring him to the tent. And he recognized that they can force Marshall for miles, and they're very thirsty and very dusty. So Solomon takes a child's full of water and offers it to King God. Now, what's interesting about that, the customs of Arabian hospitality it dictates if you offer someone a glass of water, or any kind of similar hospitality in your own home, it means that you are tacitly pledging to them that you will not harm them. So, Solomon is effectively saying, okay, guy, you lost the battle, but I'm not going to hurt you. Now, meanwhile, Ronaldo said, hey, what about me? And Solomon says to the guy, well, give some of your water to Renan. So the king says, okay. He takes a couple of drafts out of the cup and then passes it to Renan. And Renan now drinks some of the water too. At which point Solomon says, you will please note that you gave him a drink. In other words, Solomon's okay with King Guy. At least it's okay as any enemy to be. But he's not so okay with Renal. As it turns out, the guy who's eventually ransomed back to his people makes him home alive for both of the day. Whereas uh, Renal. Okay. Um, so. By the way, I just put 
this up here. Arabian proverb, uh, based on all of these uh, military and political shenanigans. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And the Arabian proverb. What do you think? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. Um, they do. And if that's the definition of friendship, I would say you don't uh, turn your back on your friends. Um, it's uh, Louis XIV, I believe. Probably the other than well, the twelve, but certainly famous for Louis XIV, said, uh, you know, you, you need to kind of keep your enemies close and your friends even closer. So, we get to uh, all this stuff happens, and this is finally what leads to the third crusade. Uh, by the way, um, uh, we're told the previous pope hears about the news of Jerusalem being taken, and the legend is that as soon as he heard this news, he died. Um, new pope. Uh, Gregory VIII. Wow. It's kind of scary. Um, Gregory VIII proclaims that the capture of Jerusalem was punishment for the sins of Christians across Europe. Now, age of faith. What the Pope says? Well, then, and up to a point around the age of this Pope, Pope, Oh, sorry. Spoke. I think it's like that. Oh, spoke. Oh, spoke in Lobo Christi. Which means in place of Christ. So, in other words, when the Pope says, well, the reason these crusades have failed so far, the reason we can get Jerusalem back, the reason it was taken again, is because of the sins of Christians. People in the age of faith would have believed that that is the same thing that Jesus coming at. So, we have another crusade. Another crusade begins to be preached. Third crusade, the King's Crusade. Um, very first person to heed that call, Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa. Holy Roman Empire. He's an old man. He's an old man. He's the first one to say, Okay, I'm on board. He, uh, he sets out for the whole land an army of 100,000 men. He hears what the Pope says. He picks up another 2,000 from Hungary trained soldiers. Meanwhile, Emperor Isaac II. It's a secret alliance with Saladin. Remember our old Saladin? Think about this now. Remember the remember the Zandra? The ones who started all this? Oh, help me, help me, the Turks are coming to get me? Okay, visit your Emperor Isaac II in the Angelus. Makes an alliance with Saladin to impede Emperor Friedrich, the old Emperor Friedrich's progress. In the meantime, the Sultanate of Rome has granted Friedrich safe passage to his further lands. So here we have Christian, double crossing Christian, Muslim, double crossing Muslim. Well, even though Friedrich was granted the safe passage, he's not impressed, and he turns against the people who allied themselves with him, Saxophonia, the capital of the Sultanate of Rome. Um, some might say Friedrich got what he deserves. It almost sounds like it should be a legend, but the best of my knowledge is actually true. Friedrich is trying to cross the river. Across the Salah River, there's 
horse missteps on a stone, he falls, he's wearing his armor, he drowns. Um, so, King Henry, King Henry of the of England, he is all ready to do this crusade thing, and something very interesting happens. He's about ready to go on the crusade, and uh, this character comes on the scene and uh, prematurely ends his life. This character, by the way, is a probably stylized picture of what we think of as Richard Lyon. Interesting issue is that Richard Lyon is King Henry II's son. So, Richard Lyon decides to depose his father, which, by the way, everybody uh, pretty much agrees with me. Well, I'm sure his father agrees with you guys. That was about it. Um, so now we have Richard Lionheart and King Philip II. Richard inherits the crown from his father, whom he just killed. He thinks he killed him, he's still alive in the crown. And um, they decide together, along with a few people from Byzantium, <coughs> you know, the ones who turned against Frederick, we're going to march on uh, the Islamic Empire. You can read, you can read the rest of yourself, what kind of circuitous route they took. Um, they finally get to, 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 to Acre, which is close enough, the Holy Land, and they begin to build siege weapons. Read, uh, weapons of mass destruction? That's what they had. Battering rams, catapults. Um, Of course, we said it was the alliance with all these changes, and now you have Richard, Philip, and Leopold are quarreling over the spoils of victory. Richard rips down the German flag from their encampments, and he would say Leopold's not happy. Um, it goes on, it goes on, and finally, they march all over. Um, battles ensue. At some point, a significant number of Islamic individuals, actually, uh, not soldiers, but also women children, are captured. The Solomon attempts to negotiate with Richard for their release. Richard uh, gets bored of negotiations and decides that he's going to uh, put all 2,700 in sword. So Richard can capitate 2,700 muscles in sight of the Islamic forces. So solid response, as you might guess, by doing the same thing to the Christians that he had captured. Um, this goes on. It goes on. You can read it yourself. I don't want to bore you with all of this. Um, See, we're just going through our, just going through our highlights here. Um, next page. September 2nd, 11, okay, so September 2nd, 1192, following the defeat of Java, Solomon is forced into a tree with Richard, providing that Jerusalem remains under Muslim control. But while allowing Christian pilgrims and traders to visit the city, thus ends the Third Crusade. Now, what's interesting about that to me is that brings them exactly to the state they were in before the First Crusade. <coughs> Nobody knew this one. They, uh, Jerusalem remains in Muslim control, but Christians are allowed to visit their trade. And then there's a terrible size. And there are occasional highway robbers and occasional piracy that uh, get punished by both sides. Right back where we started from, at the third say. Let me stop here and see if you have any questions. Thank you. Well, 
talking about um, we're talking about a population uh, armies ranging in the hundreds of thousands. Okay, uh, so probably a couple of million people involved at the height of the Third Crusade, in one sense or another. Um, we're also probably talking about a population of 25, 30 million people. So probably proportional to, to, a, to a modern conflict, actually. Um, sir? I know this is going to sound silly. No, no. I've been helping with Congress for many years. It's been a little bit of a taking it on the job and all that. 5,000 pieces of silver to 10,000 pieces of Yeah, I'm just wondering how that kind of works. I mean, obviously, we don't know that. It's not that kind of fun. 5,000 and 10,000. Somebody will have to get paid for it. Well, the truth be told, the truth be the timing of the first third to say we begin to see something happen. We're running out of resources. Europe is becoming war. And, and um, you know, it's 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 it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. The fellow who provides those five thousand pieces of silver <coughs> had way more. He was digging. Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, did, did they get out a hacksaw and cut a piece of half and divide it? Or uh, <laughs> do they are all solve or do they assume that uh, we won't pay anybody until we get back and half these guys are going to die anyway? Uh, but, but I think what you see is that by the time we get to this late stage, the rank and file are not particularly well taken care of. You are, for the most part, correct. Uh, any other things? Well, thoughts, questions? They were away, there was a lot happening. Oh, you bet. I mean, if you want to know, as much as the fiction went on to the Prince John and Robin Hood and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was gone for a long time. It was, you know, his brother was the most colored one to take over. There was so much happening when they were away. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, with any of that, I mean, you know, they had the old friends who were banned and they were saying, they could get back home to you. Oh, they could get back home to you. Myths, myths, stories, uh, of folk tales, things like Rutherford, um, are, are composites, typically. They're composites of the kind of thing that's happening. Maybe not as, you know, people, scholars are still arguing, was there ever such a figure as, 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 as Rutherford? Some provide reading that evidence saying it was, and we'll probably not agree about the story books. But the point is that, in short, there was all kinds of all kinds of power grabs, all kinds of land grabs, all kinds of money grabs, all kinds of. Um, um, you've got nine pages of notes here. It's just the, the, the most sketchy synopsis of everything I could have written down by this time. Um, the time we get to the end of the crusade, we have multiple. In of regicide, that's killing things. Um, we have all kinds of horrible things going on. Um, so, so, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure these some of us, hey, we've got to get our own house straight now. Um, what else? Richard, the Lionheart, before all. We really do 
like our heroes and our villains in black and white. The truth of the matter is, for my part, there are no meaning to the story. And maybe that's one of the points I'm trying to make, is that this was a particularly ugly time. Um, I suspect that if you delve into the history of any large scale conflicts, people discover that that's the case. Um, there are complexities, and mind you, this is all the stuff we know. We don't know the stories of contact. We don't really know what it was like to be, say, in the trenches. We don't know what the story of wrote about. And some of this is only on the surface for the last 50 or 100 years. As the anthropological sciences, as the political sciences have become more thorough in their scholarship. So, if you can imagine the best writers would double and triple cross each other, what do you suppose it is like to be an apostle to these guys? Okay. Two questions. When you say the Muslims are fighting each other, but the Sunni and the Shiite are fighting each other. Essentially, there are factions and political factions. Now, Bonhoeffer writes 
as if addressing God. I know that even Adolf Hitler is your child, God. I know that you know, even Adolf Hitler is made your image. He's a sinner, and so on. I know that when you say, Thou shalt not murder, you mean, Thou shalt not murder, even some who's done reprehensible things. I know that when you say, Everyone will be forgiven, that Christ died for all, I know what you mean. But God, I don't know what to do, and I can't sit here anymore and watch people being slow. I can't watch genocide anymore. So I know I'm sinning, and I pray you will forgive me. But moreover, I pray, Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane, that some other way will come around. This is what it did. For some people, that's what was happening. For those who really were, who really could say to them, this was an age of faith, they really believed the church was telling them. For others, yeah. only emperors, the emperor of ice cream. Let me say that a lot because it's just so visible, right? What on earth does that mean? The only thing that people really want is the water. Power. Power. Money. Um, so, fourth crusade. Fourth crusade, really quickly. Very short, approximately uh, uh, 1200 to 1204. Fourth crusade. Uh, fourth crusade, as it turns out, got diverted from. Um, Trying to take back the Holy Land to uh, Second Constantinople. Christian versus Christian. Well, obviously, this was the first time they were warning each other. It's the first time, by the way, it happens overtly. And this was the final nail. And then she's less off in the way. The final separation between the eastern part of Christianity and the western part of Christianity. Uh, Constantinople. It's destroyed, it's treasures, stolen, priests, nuns, killed, tortured, raped, you name it, they did it. Modern historians, modern historians consider that fourth crusade to possibly be the worst of American humanity to America. Outpacing even odds. People were killed, tortured, maimed, virtually by the millions. Um, fourth percent. Um, now, really, really quickly, we could spend weeks going through just like we do this. Third Crusade, so I have to pay really still We can talk about all the subsequent Crusades, and they feel a lot like what I just gave you the Third Crusade. Different names, obviously, you know, it's pretty 200 some odd years. Things change, yet they stay the same. Injuries, betrayals, and ultimately, well, hold that right here. Subsequent Crusades have been described as having ultimately failed. To regain the Holy Land of Christian control, although they finally did ensure the ability of peaceful pilgrims to travel to Jerusalem with relative safety. I just want a relative part of that, but again, I will reiterate that that's what they had prior to the um, Diminishing resources, disease, growing religious and political complexity, which was the age of faith, which is also. Um, 
less than looking for saints per her mentor. Um, 1303, 1303 is the outside dates. That was it. It's all over. Although, the human being is really stuck in history that very people discover that even though they say they were not looking for saints, the, the sword never really departed. 1300s, 1400s, it's a kind of fighting that turned what we did. Um, we talk about this. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, that's kind of a fanciful uh, picture uh, called the Last Crusader. I 
I couldn't agree with you more. But that as a it shows the full hardiness of this. But this, 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 is a, this is a 13 year old boy who fancies himself a prophet. And everyone around him is proud too. For all I know, he might say he didn't have any of But.
storm by Billy Joel, um, he didn't start the fire. Um, and uh, you know, I, I, I repented of that idea because I recognized that almost some of you have been And the rest of you was, oh, this is this. Um, you know, I, I always wanted, by the way, and if you're in the right age bracket or see yourself in the right age bracket, you'll understand this. I only wanted to do an entire sermon based out of nothing but titles and lyrics and pop songs. Um, I'll probably do that because the popular culture reflects the many things in sight That's another one. Okay, any more questions? More questions? On a regular day, day of describing this whole thing, if you still follow the name of the fact you say, and did it, and you know, I have something to tell you. Yeah, that, that was pretty quick. Cool. That was pretty quick. Cool. Uh, next week, next week I'll give you that time on that. I'll have to give you notes so you can see the world events of the popes, the kings, at least the most important ones, uh, and what happened. But we have to get If you go back to last week's notes, you'll see what happened when the military said this. Starting, then repenting of, then starting out of. Um, anyone else? Questions? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if we'll talk a little bit about it as well. Um, we're concerned, because we're moving an extra towards the Reformation, we'll focus mostly on, on, on Western history, so I'll kind of put it on the What is the big deal? Okay, let me give you, let me give you a few of them, and um, I'll preface it by saying, growing up as a Lutheran, and from the early, early, relatively young age, you became a theology geek. You know, you're kidding me, a theology geek. Yeah. So, so my friends, and I work with things in New York, so they were either Jewish or Catholic, and, and I would say, I'm a Lutheran. Missouri said it. So, and of course, all of this conception is valid. So, the Catholic is so, so you're the guys who like, you believe in God, not Jesus, right? And, uh, so, eventually, the question would come up about the difference in Eucharistic theology. I know it's hard to imagine cultural and saying Eucharistic theology, but. How I um, and I will explain to them, but unfortunately, I haven't developed a whole lot better vocabulary with this. Three dead languages later, I haven't done better vocabulary. For the Lutheran, the when the pastor got there, and those things, right? The first three elements of where one. Become for the believer the body of the Christ. They are the real presence. I think of the term real presence. Are we with these all are? Now the difference with the Catholic, the Catholic is that they transform or transubstantiate the two. In other words, the Lutheran, they are. The believer, they are. For anybody else who's not a believer, there's no way of such a <laughs> but for the believer, it's very serious. For the believer, they are actually taking in themselves the actual body of the actual blood of Christ. At least this is the traditional Lutheran viewpoint. The Catholic viewpoint is they're also taking in themselves the body of Christ. Except that instead of being, it becomes. Oh, the difference of preposition makes. And the differences between the Eastern and Western churches at this particular point in time, by the way, are about a song. About what? About a song. For example, um, in the creed, the Holy Spirit or 
proceeds from the and the father and the father and the son. Or so say you because you were born in America or Germany or England or France or something like that. But if you had been born in Greece or Russia or Armenia or something, you would have learned to say it pretty similarly. The Holy Spirit will proceed from the Father. Period. A boundary, etc. Although the argument goes back all the way to the Council of Nicaea. And the East says, hey, you guys in the West appended this little phrase. Get okay. From the Son. You appended that to it. And the people in the West say, you guys left it out. That's one difference. Um, you know, they don't worry about it. Yeah. That's one way to do it. You know, it's very good. It's sad, of course. Um, the uh, Eucharist. Oh, the Eucharist. Always a source of protection. So for the Western Church at the time of discussing, it was the Catholic Church, it was the Roman Church. By the time you get to the Crusades, you figure it out. They were pretty unsure about it for the century, but back in the day, they pretty much figured it out. It's certainly by 1200 they figured it out. Transubstantiation. When the priest said it, this becomes that. A S A S. By the way, probably this derivation of the term you might use to get focus on this. It was really quite vulgar because it's a bastardization of the mass. After that's five. This becomes that. When the priest says so. As the priest proclaims it. And by the way, when it smells, so it really gets to hell and looks. And the mention of all the whole service around this elevating the Asia, the host. In the East, all our idea. Doesn't change then. No, it changes when the priest says something from the other priests. What's the other priests? The prayer, the Eucharist prayer, invoking Holy Spirit. So, West, elements change, objects, objects, in the East, they change to the other priests. Um, what, what else? There are different thoughts about the importance of Mary. Interestingly enough, there are different thoughts on the nature of health. Um, the sun is more fast. Well, the sun, there are also different thoughts on the nature of atonement theory. What's atonement theory? How we get to be forgiven. How is it that we're sinners who still come into the righteous presence of God? Church in the West was, and still largely is, by the way, focused on the atonement theory. Uh, and I should say this right because I like it's not really funny, it's not something like Washington. Uh, people substitutionary home. It's a primary theory. In other words, if they pay penalty, they make sin. You should have paid the penalty. I should have paid the penalty. Jesus paid the penalty instead. So, substitutionary atonement. But that's not universally believed in the East. Some Eastern churches go that way, but other Eastern churches suggest something else is powerful. It's true spiritual. The victorious Christ. Christ who was victorious over the powers of death. Almost as if there were a battle going on between God and Satan. And Jesus was one of those. Hey, oh, Satan. Got no more power. So we're all on the subject. Their interpretation, by the way, of descending the depths to preach good news to captains. Literally, is going down to hell, Jesus proclaiming the gospel of them, to the only one hell they do that. Different interpretation. But equally fanciful on that. It was. Don't go to some of the places. Now, if you're in theology, deep voice, you're fascinating. But if 
if you're not a theology geek, but I kind of want to. If you're not a theology geek, one day, it's a cross for today. If you're not a theology geek, and you think, what's a big deal? I mean, I've even heard people, by the way, say, what's a big deal about atonement theories? Who cares how about this? We're never going to understand it anyway. The point is, he did. So let's just worship God, follow Jesus, and he might think no more. Oh, thank you for that question. <laughs> if this were um, a lot of folks, someone in the 1600s, I think you'd probably get some new kids out of it. However, I hear that's not what your pastor will do. So. <laughs> um, anybody else? Anybody else? Right.